Well, again, as I already said, this is a special Sunday for us as a church to join with other Great Commission Baptist churches like our own who all over the country today are observing this Racial Reconciliation Sunday, a special Sunday to reflect on an important topic. But for us, and really for all of churches like ours, it's an opportunity to look to the Word of God, because that's where we believe truth really comes from. That's where we believe real power for real reconciliation comes from, where it tells us the good news of Jesus, the one who reconciles us to God. So today we're going to read from the book of Philemon. We'll spend two weeks in it. We'll look at it next week as well, and we'll uh, start it here this morning in this new small but mighty series that we're doing over these next few weeks before we get to Easter. So two weeks in Philemon, but this week we'll focus more on the topic of racial reconciliation and why it might be an important thing. We'll end with looking at Philemon, and then we'll really dig into the book of Philemon next week as well. Let's get our key takeaway this morning. It's on the back of your bulletin if you pick one of these up. You also, of course, at your chair have a um, a pamphlet that the Ethics, Religious, and Liberty Commission, another great organization that's part of our uh, denomination of churches, has for uh, with an article on how you can be a part and your family and your friends can be a part of reconciliation, so you can make sure you take that with you. But the key takeaway is on the back of the bulletin. If you picked one of those up, it'll be behind me on the screen as well, and it's the main thing we're thinking about together this morning. Here it is for this Sunday. Racial reconciliation matters today because of our own unique history with racial injustice, our current times, and mostly because the cross of Jesus alone can bring true and lasting reconciliation. Three things we're looking at this morning. Racial reconciliation matters because, one, of our own unique history with racial injustice, two, our current times, and three, mostly because the cross of Jesus alone can bring true and lasting reconciliation. So let's dive in and look at that together. We're going to read the entire book of Philemon this morning, this whole small but mighty series. We get to read the entire book every morning because they are small but mighty. So let's read Philemon together. You may or may not be familiar with it. It is a fascinating, one of the most interesting books of the New Testament. So here is the Apostle Paul writing this letter to a man named Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant a slave, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but 
how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. So do Mark, Aristarchus, <laughs> Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. This is the word of the Lord. So fun to read an entire book together this morning. You may rightly ask yourself this morning, why in the world are we in 2022 in an extremely ethically diverse city like Los Angeles, in a pretty ethnically diverse church like Anthology, having a church service with the topic of racial reconciliation? After all, it's been 156 years since the end of the Civil War and slavery was made effectively illegal. And it's been 53 years since the final Civil Rights Act was passed in 1968. Have we not moved beyond the racial divisions and wrongs of our past and truly built a more equitable present society? And what role does a, a church anyway have, like ours, in this political and societal battle that's going on? Shouldn't we just focus on the gospel? Shouldn't we just focus on good teaching and loving our neighbor and living that out in our society and not have anything to do with you know all this social activism that others may take part in? Those are all extremely understandable questions. Let me answer those questions today with the outline I gave in the key takeaway. Why focus on racial reconciliation today in this church service? Why has our denomination focused on it since 1965 when it's been a part of our annual church calendar together. First, as I said in the key takeaway, because of our own unique history with racial injustice, we cannot escape the need for racial reconciliation because there is so much racial injustice in our own history. It's part of who we are, tragically. And to repent, if we are talking about Biblically, what it means to repent, to change, that means first acknowledging and confessing what was wrong. Then, by God's grace, moving forward into what's new and right and true. So let me explain what I mean. When I say our unique history, that our actually has multiple levels to it. First, let's start with the most obvious one that's probably perhaps on the top of our minds, our own American history of slavery. If you're an American citizen, then your story is one of the history of this country, no matter when your family particularly got connected to the United States, whether it goes back to the colonial days or goes back in the past century. Because, of course, the founding of the country was a time when all of the original colonies, including the founding fathers, many of them themselves, utilized the institution of slavery. And, of course, eventually, that conflict, that utilization, <laughs> led to the bloodiest war ever on America's own soil. 
The country, of course, thankfully ended up on the right side of slavery by the end of the war, but it didn't take merely conversations. It didn't take merely legislation to bring about change. It took countless deaths and suffering beyond the sinful institution of antebellum slavery itself. It doesn't thankfully define who our country is today, but it is a part of us. And it's a part of our history. And as we'll see in a bit, it's still a flashpoint of controversy for our own day, how we teach it and talk about it and explain it. Again, you might say, though, what does that have to do with us as followers of Jesus? What does that have to do with us as Christians, we are people of the book. We are people of the Bible, part of the kingdom of God. Our, our kingdom that we are citizens of is different than our country. And so we're not primarily focused, right, on history or those sad political chapters of our American story. But we forget, though, that nearly every person on both sides of the Civil War including just about everyone on the southern pro-slavery side, claimed to be a follower of Jesus. Indeed, many of them passionately claimed that Christianity, the Bible, rightly understood, supported antebellum slavery. White Christians, from the beginning of the American story in the 1600s into the 1700s and 1800s supported and defended slavery until forced to end it at the end of the Civil War. Often with Christian pastors being the ones leading the charge for hearts and minds. We cannot, as American Christians, say that it was only historical, political, and societal and not deeply theological as well. And really, the whole entire start of the black church in America started out of the need to follow Jesus on their own because they weren't allowed to be in white churches. But that's the first hour, our American history. The second hour, when I say racial injustice is a part of our unique history is that if you're a regular of Anthology or if you are a member, if you're new, welcome, you're watching on the live stream, we're glad you're here, but our uh, denominational history, our denominational connection, whether you know it or not, we're part of what we call the Great Commission Baptist Church Network. We use that name. It is an official recognized name that our whole convention of churches voted on about 10 years ago or so, so it's not some weird uh, made-up name, but we use that name because the other older name that has been a part of our denominational history has a whole lot of baggage to it that we would rather not get into every time we share what, connection, what network of churches we're connected to. That name, whether or not you're familiar with it, is the Southern Baptist Convention. What connection does the Southern Baptist Convention have to our American racial injustice. Well, here's how the ERLC, the Ethics Religious Liberty Commission, a part of our network of churches and the one, ones who wrote up that um, article, that pamphlet that you guys have, here's how they explain it on their website. In 1814, Baptist churches in the U.S. joined together to create the General Missionary Convention of the Baptist denomination. That sounds very Baptist-y. Uh, conventions. We are all into conventions. So that was in 1814. By 1845, the churches were divided, like the rest of the country, over the issue of slavery. White Baptists in southern states desired to make slavery a non-issue. White abolitionist force, forces in the north and among northern Baptists de desired the convention to take a moral stand against it. The following year, motivated by a dispute over slaveholders being denied appointment to serve as missionaries by the convention, a group of representatives from Southern churches created a new denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention. That's right. Tragically, our 
own network of churches was formed primarily due to a reaction to the issue of slavery, wanting to support sending missionaries who were also slave owners. When the Northern Baptists came along and said, no, th this is wrong. We are now fully realizing it. We can't support this anymore. The Southerners left and said, fine, we'll create our own denomination. Indeed, the first flagship seminary of our convention, still around today, still now a great seminary, <laughs> Southern in Louisville, Kentucky, was founded by four slaveholders themselves, not just happened to be, but actual vehement defenders of the institution. Now I want to share the wonderful news that God has done so much, such a great work in us over the last 170 so years or so, imperfect and as wrong as our beginnings were. The SBC has now become increasingly racially diverse. Today, there are thousands of SBC, Southern Baptist congregations that identify as predominantly African-American, along with lots of other uh, ethnic churches. Those African-American ones today compromise about 7% of our SBC churches. And if you look primarily, this is a badge of honor for us as Californian Southern Baptists or Californian Great Commission Baptists. You'll see the diversity of the kingdom of God on full display represented at our meeting every October that we do uh, in just in California. Last I heard, the greater Los Angeles area itself alone in the SBC network of churches had something like 50 different spoken language churches in our city and county. So not even like diverse and multi-ethnic, but actually in many different languages. And that's a beautiful thing. We are not the same as we once were, thanks be to God. But it is still part of our story. So it's a part of our American story. It's a part of our church denominational story. Lastly, unless you're visiting from out of town, if you're here, you're probably an Angelino. Maybe you've been here your entire life. Maybe you've been here a short time. But racial injustice is also part of our Los Angeles story. We could go back to what was done to indigenous populations in the city over a hundred years ago. We could go back to the U.S. Chinese Exclusion Act and the Los Angeles Chinese Massacre of 1871. We could talk about what was done in Chavez Ravine to defraud Latino Americans and their communities in order to build Dodger Stadium. We could, of course, talk about the Watts riots, which exploded from racial tensions during the civil rights era when the network, our network of churches said, we got to have a Sunday that talks about this together. Of course, during my own lifetime, we could talk about the Rodney King riots, and probably most of you here who are sitting here today would remember those when the tension that spilled over from a videotape of LAPD officers repeatedly beating Rodney King nearly to the point of death spilled over into our streets and caused all sorts of damage and violence and distress. And of course, this racial, racial tension, if you look at our city, crosses not just black and white lines, but crosses Latino and Asian lines and everyone in between. So we can't escape it as much as we would like to. So why talk about racial reconciliation today? Because racial injustice is part of our unique history in American ways, in our church network, and in our city. Second big point of those big three. Why talk about it? Because of it's part of our current times as well. How many people have heard the myriad of stories today? And I feel like there's new ones that come out every day about something called CRT, right? This is going on everywhere. You don't have to know what that's about. It's, the, it's technically a very uh, uh, academic theory that goes back a few decades with some intellectuals, but it's everywhere now, right? For something that 
most of us have probably never heard of about six months ago or so. We hear about it all the time now. There are states uh, who are rushing to pass anti-CRT laws, however those are defined, anti-CRT things for what gets done in elementary schools and what our kids are taught in school. Books are being banned because they're too racist. And on the other side, books are being banned because they talk about race too much. And on and on and on. It feels like both sides are canceling out all sorts of things, all related around how we talk about race, how we teach our own history that our country has been through, how we talk about our sins. We are people who are Christians and followers of Jesus. So these aren't just societal things and bad and wrong. These are sin and righteousness and justice matters. All those things in our own day, fully thrown into the culture wars nowadays. So again, if you think, why can't we just focus on the gospel though? Well, that would be very nice, but I'm sad to say this CRT stuff is spilling over into evangelicalism too, into our churches as well. Our own seminary presidents, men, six, six main seminaries that are part of our denominational network. One of them, Steve and I both went to. It's our West Coast one here named Gateway. These six men I incredibly respect and are great men, but they felt they need to come out with an anti-CRT statement about why it's bad. And that caused all sorts of drama within our own convention because a lot of the African Americans within our denomination said, hey, we know this isn't just about this intellectual theory that you need to respond to. It's saying something directly about what we are trying to say about why we need something like a racial reconciliation Sunday. So we can't even in our own times, get beyond these current issues now. And there is all sorts of drama at the convention that happened last year and the year before related to that. So I wish we could say we could focus just on matters of the gospel and matters of the scriptures, but they sadly don't, they sadly evade us because of all those things. And that's not to mention all the current history within our own country of uh, protests related to George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor in 2020 as all of us lived through not long ago here, some of which, of course, turn violent and riotous as well. So if you think churches like ours and others around the country who love Jesus and want to see his kingdom expanded, if you think we have not been affected by all those issues, let me tell you, we have. And I've talked to a lot of pastors, especially in places where there is more of a fierce political division within their congregations, where there have just been incredibly hard conversations and division and splits, even nowadays, that have happened. So why do we need to talk about racial reconciliation today in a Sunday church service? One, because racial injustice is a part of our unique history. Two, it's sadly a part of our current times. But lastly, most importantly, because the cross of Jesus alone can bring true and lasting reconciliation. I say can because it hasn't always in our history, right? As we saw with things like the Civil War, because if it's not applied well, it might not, but it can. And thank God one day it will fully. But this is where our great hope is, right? This is why, this is one of the reasons I'm a follower of Jesus. If Jesus and the good news can't actually make a difference in the greatest problems that we experience, then what are we doing? Where is our hope? Where can it be? Well, thankfully, it is in Jesus. No matter what color you are, no matter what ethnic background you are, it is Him, and He's the God of all of us. This is what makes the Christian hope different. It's not about us. <laughs> it's not saying that we have the answer. It's not saying that we have the ultimate solutions. We are saying when we look at the rest of history, we know, man, we don't have the answers to how to solve these great divisions into our own country. This racial injustice that we've seen over the centuries, the tension, the strife that we may have experienced ourselves. We say, we confess, we have failed miserably at times. 
And we cry out to God. That's an important part of the normal Christian life is confessing to God. I have sinned. I have failed. I have tried and I've done it in my own power sometimes and it's completely failed. We can say that together as a country, as a church network. And we say Jesus is our ultimate hope and answer. We have to have His power, His healing, His goodness. To have any hope of seeing tangible progress within our lifetime, even though we're desperately short of where we should be. This is why we, of all people, can be. The Apostle Paul said this about his own ministry. He said he was sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. We are sorrowful about our past, about our sin. Yet we have hope. We are rejoicing because of what Jesus has done. We can build a better future together. We as followers of Jesus in Anthology Church and with wider networks of churches can move forward. The kingdom of God is here. It is coming in full. It is not, thankfully, the kingdoms of this world. It doesn't have the answers that the kingdoms of this world and the culture war have. It has answers that King Jesus has for us. And the story of the gospel and what he has done leads us in a trajectory to help us love our racially different neighbor, our racially different brother and sister in Christ, to recognize racial injustice when we see it and see where we need to seek to change it and to humbly learn from one another, especially when we see things differently than others because of their culture, because of their background. That's exactly what we see laid out in this letter of Philemon. Again, we're going to dig into, if you're like, we're not getting much Bible this morning, DJ. I know, we'll, <laughs> next week we're really going to dig in it together. But in short, let me do a brief turn on it before we close and make the point here. If you're not familiar with the book at all, the Apostle Paul is the author of this short letter. He identifies himself in the beginning here when he primarily addresses this letter to a Christian man named Philemon. You can see that in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. Then in verses 4 through 7, Paul greatly encourages Philemon. He praises his faith in Christ, his love for other Christians, and his example to everyone else. Sounds like Philemon is a really good dude. And he is loving Jesus, and he's walking with him, and he is an example to others in the community. Paul expresses his own love for Philemon as well. Then, Paul does something interesting. It seems like, okay, he's getting to the main point of this letter. He brings up a guy named Omnesimus. And it seems very strange when we first come into it, because we don't have the background that everyone else had, and that the church certainly would have had when they heard these names mentioned. But in verse 8, Paul says this, Accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. Okay, something going on there. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Okay, so as best we can gather from all the sources in the New Testament and the scholarship that we have, Omnesimus was once a bondservant, or slave would be a word that we would use more appropriately. Not the same slavery back two millennia ago in Asia Minor where this would have been, and in the um, ancient Middle East world was not the same as our American antebellum slavery, but it was still a form of that. So Omnesimus was a slave who ran away from his master perhaps stealing from him as he left and ran away. That master, we can tell from this letter, is Philemon himself, it appears. Somehow, this guy, Omnesimus, after he had fled from his master through God's providence, Omnesimus meets up with the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. So that likely means Omnesimus got caught <laughs> doing something they shouldn't have been doing, got thrown in jail, just so happens, 
he gets stuck next to the Apostle Paul in a jail cell, who was put in jail for sharing the gospel and telling people about Jesus. So what does Paul do with Omnesimus? Despite his slave status, does he go, oh, well, not going to talk to this guy. He ran away from uh, his master, clearly committed some crimes to end up here in jail, and I'm just going to leave him to himself, and I'll just focus on writing letters to different churches, blah, blah, blah. No, Paul shares the gospel with him, what he does everywhere he goes, right? He says, you have an ear to hear, I'm going to tell it to you. And if you're stuck in a jail cell next to me, you're going to hear all about it. A disobedient slave, Omnesimus is, what does Paul do? He shares Jesus with him. He shares the gospel. Paul knows, as we sang, Paul knows spiritually he was once a slave. He was a slave to sin. Paul knows he was disobedient to God. At other places in his letters, he says, I was the worst. I was the chief of sinners. He helped to throw other Christians in jail before Jesus appeared to him and he was changed. He had a hand in killing other Christians. Paul says, I was a slave to sin. I was disobedient to God. This is all of our story as well, right? If you've put your trust in, in Jesus. And Paul knew Jesus breaks the chains of our slavery to sin. Paul knew Jesus sets us free through his death and resurrection. Paul knew Jesus' blood pays our debt. And every time we celebrate communion together, and they did back then, they are reminding themselves of the work of Jesus through his body and his blood in the chains that he suffered were broken, and then he died and then rose from the dead, and all spiritual and physical chains broken off him. Paul knows that was freely given to him by grace. Not because he earned it. Not because he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and got his act together and got his life together, but because of grace. So Paul figures, how can I not share the good news with Omnesimus, no matter what he's done? Hallelujah, that's how we should be to everyone we meet as well, no matter who they are. Love your enemies, Jesus said. One of the greatest evils, if you study the history of antebellum slavery within our own country, one of the greatest evils, and actually you can go to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. I've been there myself. Great museum if you're ever in the nation's capital. There is an exhibit, or there was when I was down there, that had the slave Bible, it was called. And one of the greatest evils was that many slave owners, because they said, uh, if we, we want, we think Jesus and Christianity is good for everyone and would be good for the slaves too. However, there's a lot of stuff in there about freedom and Jesus breaking chains and changing lives. And we don't want the slaves to get the idea that they should be free from their own slavery. And so they actually ripped out sections that pertain to the Exodus, that pertain to freedom in Christ and what Paul's words here. So it just kept to the things that wouldn't stir up problems. You can see that Bible. If you do a Google search for slave Bible, you can read all about it and hear some of the evil. Because they feared black African slaves would be encouraged by the good news of Jesus. You bet they would. That's the whole point of the good news of Jesus. Jesus said, I came to set the prisoner free. I came to break the chains of oppression. I came to bring good news to the poor. The greatest narrative of the Old Testament was God miraculously breaking his people out of 400 years of slavery. The whole creation narrative from Genesis to Revelation paints a picture of not one race superior to another, especially by the time Jesus comes along and starts doing all sorts of crazy stuff that the Jews were like, what? You can't do that with 
other people. It paints the story of a God who makes all people everywhere, black or white, African, European, Russian, Ukrainian, all people in his image. And the future kingdom of God that Jesus is building is one from every race and every tribe and every culture. So Omnesimus hears this good news. <laughs> and Paul says, Omnesimus became a Christian. He says, I became his father. That's a spiritual sense, right? He's saying he accepted Christ. He put his faith in Christ because of the message I had. And I started basically discipling him in prison, we, we assume, as it's going on there. What better place to disciple someone? He is now, Omnesimus, spiritually free, right? He's forgiven. He's cleansed. He's now a child of God, a son of God. He's got an inheritance forever in the kingdom of God. He is spiritually new. But there's a problem, right? He is physically still a slave. And he's a disobedient one at that, right? A criminal at that. He is spiritually free, but physically not. What does his new spiritual freedom mean for his physical and very real and tangible slavery? That's what the letter of Philemon's all about. Philemon was Onesimus' master. Philemon was a Christian, himself changed by the good news of Jesus. Onesimus ran away from Philemon possibly defrauded him because he was technically his property, so took away money and stole from Philemon. But perhaps also some scholars theorize might have stolen from Philemon and said, well, while I'm <laughs> getting out of my master's house, might as well take some of his money while I'm at it and make, make something for myself. But then Omnesimus meets Paul in prison. Paul shares the gospel with him. Omnesimus becomes a follower of Jesus. So what does Paul do to appeal to Philemon, who he has a personal relationship with? What does he appeal to him to do now about Onesimus? Verse 8, accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. So we'll dig into this more next week. So interesting, right? He says, I could make you do this, essentially, but I don't want to do that. I want to appeal to you for love's sake to do what? He says he could command him using his apostolic authority, but will not do that. He wants to appeal for love's sake. Essentially saying, because of love, do what? Paul appeals to Philemon as Nesimus' former master to have his new spiritual freedom match his physical freedom here on earth. His appeal to him is to set him free and make him no longer his slave. Verse 15, For this perhaps is why Omnesimus was parted for you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer a bondservant, no longer a slave, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother in Christ especially for me, but now also for you, both in the flesh, physical, and in the Lord, spiritual. They need to match now, Philemon. So if you consider me your partner, receive him the same way you'd receive me, a free brother in Christ. Philemon, your faith in Jesus has refreshed me, Paul says. I'm so encouraged by how you love the church and live out your faith in public. But something marvelous has happened to your former slave, Philemon. Omnesimus, I know he left you. I know he stole from you. I know he put you and your family in a very vulnerable place probably when all of a sudden he was gone and he took whatever he took from you. But you know what? God had a plan. <laughs> In it, Philemon, he had a plan. Onesimus heard the good news. I got to share the gospel with him. He's become a Christian. 
He's spiritually free now. He's not just a slave. He's a brother in Christ. And so, Philemon, I'm appealing to you based on the freedom you have been given by Jesus. Treat him equally now as you treat me. Grant him his freedom. Grant him his physical freedom as his master to match his new spiritual freedom. Grant him the freedom and equality that you have been given by Christ, which you did not earn and you did not deserve. See how that's working out? See what Paul's doing here? You see how the good news of Jesus, Paul, is appealing? You see the trajectory that he is speaking to here? He's saying, essentially, the the trajectory of what the good news of Jesus does. Clearly, because you you look at the rest of the New Testament, slavery is not, it's not like off the get-go, Paul's like, slavery's gone, you know, get rid of it. Like the whole society was still built upon that in different ways, because if you conquered one nation, the nation automatically became your slave. There's all sorts of complicated things going on in the Roman Empire here. But the trajectory here is really clear. This is why the abolitionists in our own country were always on the more biblically faithful side of the Civil War than the ones in the South who defended slavery. They recognized the freedom won by Jesus through his blood on the cross leads to a trajectory of making all men and women equal and free in Christ. And the physical reality of society, the physical reality of our churches, again, how many people understand that if you were to walk into a church in the South, the white people were down low, the black slaves were up on top. The abolitionists and others recognized the trajectory of the good news of Jesus changes all that. The physical reality of society should match the spiritual reality of what the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God that is coming should look like. Now to close. You might ask, what does this have to do with me? (laughs) How do I do racial reconciliation? That's great for Philemon individually. I personally have no slaves. I assume you don't either hanging out at your own house. So what is the point for me today? I'll close with this one point. We'll dig into it more next week. Let me point out to you now, did you notice who Paul wrote the letter to? To Philemon, right? And it's clear it's mainly to Philemon because the we don't see this in, in Greek There is a, just like Spanish, if you happen to speak Spanish or another language that has a singular U and a plural U. In Greek, there are singular U's and plural U's. So in the beginning, Paul uses plural U's. He's talking to more than one person. And then he switches when he gets to the main body of the letter. And it's all a singular U, meaning it's clear he's talking mainly to Philemon. But he addresses the letter to more than just Philemon. You see that? He also says... To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, we don't know much about her, Archippus, our fellow soldier, also know much about him, but also to the church, the whole church, in your house. Why would Paul do that? (laughs) Why is Paul taking a clearly individual letter meant for an individual person and addressing it also? to the entire church. Why not just give it to Philemon? Because Paul is saying the whole church has a responsibility when we look at the good news of Jesus to see this matter through that I'm addressing to Philemon. We're so, in the West and in America, we're so individual, right? We're so independent. We're so me, 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 my world, I do what I want to do. Paul here is addressing this to everyone and essentially saying to the rest of the church, y'all need to see that Philemon follows through with what I'm giving him here. This is a corporate matter. We all have a part to play in this 
together. All Christians bear a responsibility to see the equality and justice and peace of the kingdom of God set in motion and become true in our church, hopefully in our community and in our wider country as well as we love our neighbor as we advocate for justice and truth and equality all of us bear responsibility to speak out when there is racial injustice and wrong when physical freedom and equality doesn't match the spiritual reality that the good news of jesus brings to everyone who trusts in it that is our role today we'll dig into it more next week as we look more at Philemon. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the good news you have given to us. I have talked a long time this morning, but we are so grateful for the work of the cross. We're so grateful for what you have accomplished for us. We're so thankful that even 2,000 years ago, we have, that you preserved this letter of Philemon, so that we could see such a practical situation and how the good news of Jesus applies to change things in our churches, things in society, and how we can join and seeing the equality and freedom of the kingdom of God made known in our own church, our own community, our own country. Lord, show us ways we can do that. Show us how we can recognize. Show us how we can just start talking with people who are different than us and getting to know them and humbly asking questions, especially people that see things differently than we may or the majority of people we connect with may. Show us how to take those steps, especially with people who are different than us, and to live out some of that reconciliation together in our church, in our community, and in our country. Lord, guide us in how to do that. We pray in Jesus' name.